I am willing to fight now, Simon. Man, that's such a nice camera. I believe that Gargaboom is in charge of, of, the, of the weather. Get your phone out of my face. You take my photos for free, and I promise I will bring you so much business. You know what? I'll just bring them off this way. Hello and welcome to the second installment of the Dublin Photography School podcast, Snapshot. On September 28, as part of Dublin Photography School's Thursday Talk series, Martin Craig, a lecturer, photographer and published author, gave a talk on Introduction to Documentary Practice. We recorded this as part of our podcast. Have a look at our show notes to follow along with the slides that were presented during the talk. We hope you find it as informative and enjoyable as we did. How documentary began to define itself um, in the early 20th century. There's a few key things. The idea of social problems, social issues, social awareness. All these things are embedded within, within the practice. Um, motivated by a lot of activism. Motivated by the idea that you can reform things um, through photographing. Or you can find a problem, photograph it, and bring a certain level of awareness to the public. And therefore make some kind of change. Like, it is questionable. But in the 1930s, there were some success stories that, that make it quite uh, reasonable that this can happen. Uh, but also the idea of the identification with working classes or lower classes. You know, predominantly, you know, it's an identification with, with the world of labour or the world of the underprivileged and kind of highlighting the problems within that um, that are crucial. Um, and also the idea that social concerns are more important than aesthetic values which again is questionable because, you know, photography has to have some kind of aesthetic value or people won't necessarily pay too much attention to it. Um, and this is a problem that has been encountered you know, through the, the practice or through the canon of documentary photography. Um, all of these things, I'm sorry for the, the content, but uh, all of these things, um, you know, are embedded within this particular story of, of Minimata by W. Eugene Smith. I, I've heard of W. Eugene Smith. It's, Really incredible figure. Um, this is a story. This is an image from a project that he did in Minimata, and it's quite harrowing, quite horrific. But uh, a, a, a chemical organisation called Chizo um, were polluting the waters in this town called Minimata, creating what they called Minimata disease, um, which was connected with kind of mercury and heavy metals and stuff like that. And you know, it took a little while for these effects to show, kind of second generation. Well, a lot of children were born with defects and, and all sorts of problems, um, this being one. And you, W. Eugene Smith lived in Minimata for over two years. And for the entirety of his two years there, he was you know, trying to be uh, an activist against this company. He was taking photographs of the, the, the problems that were caused by, by uh, mercury poisoning in the water. And he was getting beaten up regularly. Um, but he still created this story that got, you know, attention, the, the world's attention to the problem of uh, uh, mercury poison and minimata disease. Uh, to the fact that the company had to recomp or try to compensate people for what they'd done. Um, so again, you could suggest it's, it's a little success story. Not that you'd be ever compensated for, for stuff like this. But again, it was the pressure that was put on the company by the work of the photographer, you know, making awareness of, of this problem um, that, that brings about this little change, uh, albeit not too, not, not too uh, great. Uh, so the idea of exposure, awareness and reform is again kind of rooted in, in the practice. Has been and still is, you know, that idea that as a category documentary should be, you know, looking at these social issues, social things, social problems, or, you know, it, it, there's a degree of activism that's there that has not gone away. Um, also, the idea of political commentary, social commentary, is crucial in the conversation. Um, you know, for the photograph is, is a really, really powerful tool. It's incredibly powerful, and it's got an amazing currency and, and an amazing way to kind of embody um, embody the climate of any time, or embody the kind of social issues or social um, uh, social kind of atmosphere of any any given time. Um, many of you may many of you may have heard of Robert Frank uh, from the 1950s. Um, this is an image that was taken around about I think it's a, there's a time frame of a week or two weeks from the famous Rosa Parks incident, 
but she refused to move, to move from the bus. So what you're looking at is something that's, that's quite, for us, quite historic. We all kind of know about it. And we all know about you know, the problem with uh, civil rights that existed in the 50s in the United States. Um, so what you're looking at is something that's very, very raw, very current for the photographer. And he, he watches the trolley car pass him. And this appears in front of his viewfinder. I mean, the formal qualities are the first thing to note. You know, dead straight lines, all of that stuff. Uh, but, but what does it say? What kind of commentary does it give? You know, you have the hierarchy, almost the American hierarchy of the time, um, lined out right there in front of the in front of the photographer's camera. You have the 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 lady at the front, two spoiled brats, the bow tie, and you have the African American man and the older African American woman. It's a hierarchy that's right there, presenting itself in front of the camera, and it's incredibly strong as as commentary. You know, it is a really, really strong social comment of the 1950s. You could probably read books about it and you could probably watch movies, but it's right there, just for that second, that moment. Um, and again, I think it's, you know, sometimes photographers can be very undervalued as, as practitioners, you know. Um, this is a guy in the world who's intuitive, he spots it and he has the skill to, to get it, you know. Um, where the magic in the image is really in the gestures, isn't it? Like, the hierarchy is one thing, that he, it kind of appears in front of him. But it's the combination of gestures that really make the picture. You know, the lady at the front is looking at Frank. Like, she's looking at him, thinking, you know, how dare you, you know? Don't show me. This is not me. This is, this is not my problem, you know? Uh, she looks like she's kind of experiencing a bad smell, you know? It's very hard to kind of describe what's going on. Uh, the kind of confident child right there, the dicky bow, you know, um, very well dressed, very well taken care of. I think it's the guy behind, I think it's his expression that, that make the picture. You know, kind of defeated maybe, you know, there's that kind of element there that just really give it a kind of a power. So, you know, while, while the photographer is always ready and people like Robert Frank are very you know, they have a level of awareness uh, with the environment. Sometimes the world offers you a picture, you know, and we're quite lucky to have something like this. Because again, it, it, it brings us right back to that problem. It shows us what we were, you know, uh, like a reminder. Um, I did see this image um, around about the time Obama was um, inaugurated for the first time. Um, and I was in Boston, and this image was in a room, probably about bigger than this actually, it was the only photograph in the room, in the Museum of Modern Art. And it was right at the centre, and it was big velvet rope around it, and a uh, spotlight. Uh, so, you know, the power of it had come back. It became this kind of thing where that became, had great currency and great value, socially, because it was this you know, really, really powerful statement of the 1950s. And then what underpins it is how far people had come in this regard. Um, questionable, maybe now, but anyway. Um, so, um, the value of the photograph should, the value of the medium should not never be underestimated. And, you know, when I think of the value of photography, my only starting point is to try to imagine a world without photography. You know, because we have a kind of a clear photo, uh, image, uh, mental impression of, let's say, the okay, 1920s, 1900s, 19, uh, 1850s. We have an idea of what it looked like because we have photographs. Um, we kind of, you know, draw a few blanks when it comes to the 17th century, the 16th century, the 15th century. I mean, can you imagine if we had photographs of the Vikings, for example, if there was a camera there? Um, this is why photography becomes so important. And every now and then, um, every now and then, an image kind of just makes me stop on my tracks. And I don't know if any of you saw this, it was a couple of weeks ago on, on I can't remember which newspaper. Um, it just kind of popped up. And it's one of these things that kind of, 
and reconfirm my own ideas about the value of the medium, or the beauty of the medium. And it's by Ken Russell, who's not a photographer. He's, you, you probably recognize the name. He's, he's a, a filmmaker. He did the, the Who's Tommy. <laughs> and he's kind of known uh, uh, for this uh, industry. You know? But these are images that he took in the 1950s as a, as a, well, he was a kid or a student or just out of interest or whatever. And uh, he took a series of, you know, he, he was kind of looking at the, the teddy boy thing, the post-war uh, teddy boy, who kind of dressed like the neo-Edwardian age, you know, it was the fashion of the time. Um, and he concentrated on these teddy girls, and I'd never even thought about it, I'd never known about it, about these girls. They were kind of a really interesting subculture that existed, that, you know, I'd never heard of, and I thought it was quite fascinating. But contained within that picture, I feel, is, you know, kind of everything that, that I personally love about photography. You know, it's, she is a product of her time, you know. Like, the way she's dressed, the way she's standing, and she, she's a product of the time, post-war. There's that kind of almost jump from traditions that existed just before the war. She's in an environment that is post-war London. So you have the destruction of London. And she's like this kind of flower that, that's growing up uh, from this destruction. But what I also love about it, I think, is just the, the, the kids in the background. The photographer, the photograph, and the guy taking the photograph is the event, you know? Like, he's, he's there, and they're all trying to get into the picture at the same time they're a little reluctant to get into the picture, you know? Um, you know, the f photographic world has changed so much that we've all got smartphones, but you can imagine the, the guy with the camera here drawing all this attention, you know? Um, but everything is there. And it brings us to the notion of like, what photography can, can do best, particularly when it comes to portraiture, um, the idea of ethnography, and the idea of you know, describing cultures at different times, showing us what life is like, different customs, uh, all of these things. So photography's role in this is really, really crucial because it kind of describes things to us in, in, you know, in, in a very, very um, accessible way. Um, and the idea of ethnography you know, goes way back to the very, very beginning. Um, these are images that I stumbled upon, re quite recently actually. And they're uh, by a guy called William Carrick, who was Scottish. And he for some reason he ended up in St. Petersburg <laughs> from Scotland. I think his father was a merchant. And as a kid he was wealthy enough that he could afford to, on his leisure time, and take photographs of people. So these are studies of people that he's done in St. Petersburg in 1850s. And you know, you're talking about you know, a period of 15, 16 years um, from when photography was kind of really introduced to the general public, you know? 1839 being the date it was supposedly invented. Um, but the 1840s was really when photography became very accessible to, to a broader public. Um, and William Carrick, instead of, you know, on his leisure time photographing the things we all photograph, you know, beauty and things we love and bridges and stuff like that, he turned his attention to just describing people, tradespeople, everyday people um, in St. Petersburg. What I find really interesting is he seems to also have clued on to the fact that he needs to do it in a neutral environment. So that you're not drawn, your attention is not drawn to anything. Your kind of attention is very much on the figures, the characters, who they are, what they look like. And it's a really significant record, you know? Again, can you imagine if we had this record from the 16th century? You know, we learn so much more. And, and the, the real value of the medium is that it does fill that block. You know, it does really describe for us in a very, very detailed, very accessible way the lives of other people and other times. Um, more so than any other, any other kind of medium, any other practice. Uh, and that's, that's really the, the key for photography and the value for photography. Um, but also, I think, you know, eth the idea of ethnography is huge in, in the conversation of documentary. Um, just fast forwarding a bit to the work of August Sander. Um, have any of you heard of August Sander? He's a really important figure in the, in the history of documentary practice. Um, could probably talk for two hours of three hours, four hours about this guy. Um, I won't. Promise. <laughs> I promise. We've all got homes to go to. Uh, but Sanders' work is called The Face of Our Time. And he documented the 
broad demographic of German, the German population between the First and Second World Wars. Um, and it's a huge, huge, huge index, like a chronicle of everybody living in Germany, not everybody, but every type of person living in Germany, particularly around where he lived in a place called Westerwald. He documented uh, the blind, Jewish, young Nazi soldiers, uh, painters, artists, avant-garde people, bankers, in the same way, just describing them. What was interesting about his work is, I suppose, what happened to most of his archives and his collection. Um, when the Third Reich came into power, they had public burnings of his book, and they destroyed most of his collection. And what we're left with is, is pickings, you know, which shows you, I you know, in the 1930s, the, that the Third Reich felt threatened by this. Uh, but I think, from our point of view, with the kind of benefit of hindsight as to what happened to people like this, I think it's really, really powerful. And many of these people were sent to concentration camps. And, you know, the German population was distilled down to, um, you know, very, very narrow uh, demographic in, in, in this regard. So it brings, again, I think, from our point of view, Sander in this time was just using his instinct, you know. He, he just start, his starting point was just a general interest in people, what they look like, the customs, what they are, um, and describing that for us. Um, the power of it is that we know what happened to them. We know the context of that. We know what happened to all these archives and these people. And it brings back to us again you know, the, the, the necessity for photography and the, the, the value of photography. But the value of the photographer as well. People that, you know, do it. <laughs> Sometimes we forget that someone pushing the button and that has to get up in the morning and have a cup of tea and off out the door, you know, and, and spend their life out in the world, you know, um, capturing these things. Um, and that's the starting point for everything. The value of it seems to just be a, a side product of it, you know. Um, but Sander is someone that's very important in this, in this you know, um, in the canon of documentary. Because again, it does highlight the value. It also, also shows a kind of a, you know, a working methodology for documentary photographers. I mean, it's very, very similar to the guy in the 1850s in St. Petersburg. And it's very, very similar to what's employed in, in the, the, the current day and age. Sorry, I'll skip that. In the current day and age, um, this is a contemporary German photographer called Albert Tupke, who again has the same interest, the same methodology, still dealing with German people, you know, uh, carrying on these traditions. And you will find within, you know, within the practice of documentary, you, you do find people carrying on traditions, you know, decade after decade. Um, the formal qualities, the interest in characters, the interest in um, how people look, the customs, the way people are, um, still there. Um, Albert Tukke. Um In our own context, um, you know, a lot of people in an Irish context, it's kind of funny, again, photography is so undervalued, I don't think there are too many, let's say, famous names in photography or documentary as, as opposed to, say, in literature or filmmaking or animation. Photographers seem to get a, a bad deal in terms of publicity and a sense of value uh, within popular culture. But Michelle Sank is, and other people, you know, have, have documented Irish culture and changes and transitions and how we are, customs. Um, all these things, you know. Um, this is a really interesting project. If you get a chance, um, I would check it out. It is, um, it's a project about teenagers in Belfast in 2005. What I love about it is the simplicity. It's simple. Simple. You know, an interest in, in people in Belfast in 2005, very, very shortly after the Good Friday Agreement, was a change of atmosphere, a change of, of, of politics, you know. Um, and her work is quite interesting. She asks kind of teenagers who live in Belfast um, to bring her to a spot they identify with, that they call their place, their home, where their identity is formed. And um, some of the kids bring her to these areas of grasslands. It's like removed from Belfast, or removed from the background, but still there. Um, the image on the right, I absolutely love. It's, it's a pride in one's culture, you know? Very strong, very, very proud of, of um, of the culture, but also hiding the little Irish flag under, you know, under the other flag. She's quite beautiful. The subtleties in it are quite nice. Um, she suggests she's interested in creating, you know, uh, like psychological landscapes or uh, interplays of human form, location, 
Um, but it's sociological, it's, it's ethno ethnographic. Like something like this is, in a hundred years from now, it, phew, its value is huge. If, because she's paying attention to it and like the rest of the population are not, you know. Um, this is the real, real value. And again, the starting point for documentary photographers is just simple curiosity and a willingness to, to be out photographing our times. Um, not just, you know, doing it now for the now, you know, but doing it now with, with the, the idea that it is an important practice, you know. It's really undervalued at times and really underestimated and really misused. But a very, very, very important practice nevertheless. Now, are you sick of me? <laughs> what time is it? Are we... Uh, we have 15 minutes. Oh, really? Okay. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, that's not a problem. Uh, could I quickly show you two contemporary forms of documentary? <laughs> then I will shut up. I promise. <laughs> I promise. Um, because I, I think it's very important. Documentary, the, the tradition of documentary now is... I mean, photography is in a very, very strong place now. And they're largely down to self-publishing, social media. You know, photography has amplified and become a very, very dominant practice in the world. You know, very popular, of course, with everybody. But a very, very dominant practice right now, a very important practice. And, um, you know, the birth of the photo book, for example, is something that's, that's crucial in the conversation. Um, you know, the way, the way in which social media has highlighted documentary projects. You, know, you have access to like the world, you know, um, through social media. Whereas maybe 20 years ago, if you wanted to see a documentary project, you know, it's very difficult. You know, where, where do you access it? Maybe through some magazines. Magazines are limited. Maybe some books, but there's not really many places in libraries that store photographic books. You know, very limited access we have to, to kind of real contemporary photography. 20 years ago. Now it's kind of really, really accessible. I think it's quite exciting. A lot of people have a negativity about the medium. Not me. I think it's at the beginning almost of something new and refreshing and brilliant. Um, and documentary practitioners, um, you know, oh, sorry, I need more. Uh, documentary practitioners in the contemporary world are, it's a very exciting practice. It's free. There's a freedom about documentary practice right now that um, is crucial. Where photographers and, are using archive materials, still life recordings, uh, they're using all sorts of different materials, not just photographs, to tell stories. And one of the best story uh, narrative makers, storytellers, is uh, this photographer called... Oh, sorry. But, uh, ah, I'm stuck. Hang on. No, hang on. Give me one second. No, it doesn't like me today. Uh. There you go. Um, never rely on anything. <laughs> That's the truth. You know. Um, this is one of the one of the key storytellers. One of the best is this girl, Diana Markovian, and she's from Armenia, and she's astonishing. I think she's about to become a member of Magnum, and she is just one of the most intelligent story makers when it comes to to photography at the minute. She did a project called Inventing My Father, which is about her trying to reconnect with her father, and it's a really incredible way of telling a story um, about a subject who's not there, you know, and trying to reconnect with, this, with her father figure. Uh, but this is a really powerful story called uh, School Number One. And she was commissioned to respond to the 10th anniversary of the tragedy that happened in Beslan. I don't know if, if any of you remember this, where some rebels shot up a school in Beslan. They held ho uh, lots of children hostage and it was, it was all over the news for about six, seven days, maybe more. Um, so she went back to this location on the 10th anniversary and did a project in retrospect about the, uh, the tragedy. Um, now what you have is, is contemporary documentary in its best form. You know, she has, you know, the interiors of the place, she has really strong formal portraits of people affected. Um, she, you'll see she's got, you know, the homes of people who were lost, 
um, you know, that sense of loss is very strong. She's brought in graphic elements that the children did, or the, the now teenagers did, and she's incorporated into the work. She's incorporated stills from the event into the, into the book, um, class photographs with people's drawings and sketches. You know, um, the practice still lights, really difficult and harrowing still lights to look at. So this is the, the, the documentary photographer right now. It's not limited to, you know, dealing with what you see. It's using materials, using still life, using graphics, using texts, all of these things. Um, predominantly for, you know, for book form. Um, but Marcosian is, is superb and I think she's quite brave, you know. I mean, seeing work like this, I hadn't seen it before. I hadn't seen someone take that step where they've done this, introduced this. Um, and then it frees, it almost frees everybody else making documentary to do it. There would have been a risk, you can imagine, of, it, of her almost turning this really serious thing into a novelty act by doing this. But it, it really, really works. There's such a level of seriousness to it and telling the story in such a strong, powerful way. Um, that's Diana Marcosian. And oh, I hope this one works. Uh, the second is... The, you know the notion that documentary um, is, is exists in in um, book form, particularly self-publishing books. Um, this is a really interesting, important project that has surfaced in the last year or two, and it's about Monsanto and genetically modified food. And it goes into the history of Monsanto, so it goes back to these locations where Monsanto had built these houses, or supposedly the houses of the future. Uh, there they are. Uses, uh, he uses, um, you know, eight millimeter footage. Um, it transpired that these houses um, were very dangerous to live in. They've been, they've been built with these chemicals and the plastics that that started to affect people and a huge cancer rate of people living in these uh, areas. You know, so this is the kind of basis of it. Going back and forth, she goes to Vietnam because Monsanto had developed Agent Orange. To, you know, so she goes to the effects of this. Um, and you know, tracking that story by, you know, it's 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 about the past and what's what's happened to this location, which was supposed to be the future, and you know, the chemical company that did so much destruction, not in America, not just in America, but you know, further afield. Um, again, using texts, testimonies, archive material, postcards, um, still life footage from eight millimeter cameras, um, formal portraits. You know, kind of, it's very, very broad in its in its story, um, and again, it's slightly braver, using kind of graphics and being a little free with the image to kind of uh, build up the story. Context is huge as well. You see the texts above the images. Um, like the best place for documentary photography is really in the book because you can you can pack a lot of these things in, you know, and it's very accessible. The form as well mimics a manual that was, you know, um, that belonged to Monsanto, the company itself. Um, but this is kind of the look of documentary right now. It's got everything that, you know, we've talked about in the last hour, you know, the sense of activism, the sense of research, the idea of investigative journalism, um, all of these things are there, you know? The kind of formal qualities of the portraits, you could hark them right back to the 18th, 18th uh, 19th century, you know, the way in which they're photographed. Um, use of still lives and all these things become very, very important in, in telling the story. Um, that's an awful story. I do apologise. <laughs> there's, 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 there's not a lot of happy documentary photography, you know, it's very hard to find. But um, hopefully the kind of overview of, of the practices is, is helpful and insightful. And again, we only kind of, can kind of scratch the surface of, of it, you know. Um, but, you know, I'd encourage everyone, if, you, if you've taken little notes and stuff like that, go look at this work, because it's really powerful. And I think it might lead you onto other work um, that's equally as powerful. Are you looking to do a photography course or workshop in the Dublin area? We here at Dublin Photography School run a range of photographic courses, workshops, location shoots, and even photography holidays that will suit your digital photographic needs. Why not pop on over to our website at dublinphotographyschool.ie and see our full range of courses and workshops. Also, why not check out our Facebook group page, our Twitter account and our Instagram account.